We will begin with our opening hymn, the first hymn that you folks selected. It is Afflicted Saint, Do Christ Draw Near. We'll sing verses 1 and 2. And uh, note with this one, the refrain is not sung after verse 1. So we'll sing verse 1, 2, and then the refrain. Hymn 867, if you'd like to follow the music of your hymn. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. 
If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will prevail us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful in my nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment, both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we continue with the Kyrie. In peace let us pray to the Lord.
in this first part of the service in the hymnal, we will often repeat these same two first hymns at the beginning. And the fact that we list them by their Latin names is a hint that these hymns that we sing, they are very old. They go back to a time in church history where Latin was the only language that was spoken. Uh, the first of these hymns, which you've heard me make reference to this title before, is called the Kyrie, which is short for Kyrie Eleison, which when translated means, Lord have mercy. It's a common refrain that people throughout the Bible would use both in the Old Testament and the New Testament in speaking to the Lord. And it well mirrors our confession of sins. We ask God to have mercy on us as well. Uh, this, in hymn form, the Kyrie, we have records of dating back to the 5th century in church history, and in all likelihood, it probably goes back even earlier than that. The second hymn that we sung then was the Gloria. That is short for Gloria and Excelsis Deo, which means Glory be to God on high. Maybe you can recall that goes back to a refrain that the angels sung on that first Christmas morning in the skies over Bethlehem, where our Savior Jesus had just been born. It's a hymn that beautifully announces God's peace, favor, and forgiveness to all people because of this child, and therefore a hymn that mirrors our absolution as God announces his, his peace, his mercy, his forgiveness upon us. Uh, the Gloria, we have records of that going back to the 4th century in church history. And again, in all likelihood, they were probably singing it even before that, even before we have those written records. Maybe you're, you're starting to get it. It's, it's clicking a little bit. As human beings, we love to sing. And these hymns, they memorably reinforce what it means for us to approach God and why we can do it, even when we fall so short of it. And additionally, the fact that they are so old reminds us of something else. They remind us that what we sing in church is bigger than just our own time and place, our own culture and its preferences, but rather what we hear about in church connects us to a belief that is important for all people. Christianity is truly the religion for all. And the fact that we sing these ancient hymns from a different time and place well reflects that. That being said, we don't just sing old hymns, we have beautiful new hymns as well that we use to praise God and we'll praise Him in our next hymn, both for His work just in the world around us, but then especially for His work for us and His Son Jesus who died for our sins. Our next hymn is How Great Thou Art. If you're following on, along in the hymnal, it's hymn 612, and we will sing stanzas one through three. Thank you. 
after we have approached God in the first part of our service, and after being assured of a right relationship with Him, we now have the joy and privilege to listen and learn from Him. In our Lutheran liturgy, this part of the service, therefore, has historically been called the service of the Word. As Lutherans, we like to say things like, we are saved by Scripture alone, or we like to answer difficult questions, difficult Bible passages by saying, let Scripture interpret Scripture. And that helps explain the second part of the worship service. So I mean, feature, obviously, Bible readings in this part of the worship service. It's also why many Lutheran pastors like to give introductions to help explain the readings. I mean, what, what is God's word if you don't understand how it applies to you? And then finally, it's, it's why we don't just pick these readings randomly. If you weren't aware, in our church body, we typically follow a three-year set of readings. We call that the lectionary. And this set of readings contains an Old Testament reading, a psalm, a gospel reading, and an epistle reading for every Sunday during those three years. It's our way of getting a well-rounded approach to the Bible so that we can hear the entirety of what God's Word says over the course of several years. And it's why you don't want to be in church as often as you're able to, otherwise you're going to miss some of this. Along with that, you can be sure that when you're in church, what you are hearing is all of what God wants you to hear, since this isn't just your pastor handpicking what, what he wants you to hear. Uh, among all these readings, the, the Gospel reading is often the most prominent for us. Uh, and that's exactly for the reason you're probably thinking about. Of all the readings, the gospel focuses us on Jesus' words and his works the most. Uh, since we as Lutherans also believe we are saved by Christ alone as the central message of Scripture alone, that makes sense for us to highlight the gospel reading. And it's why we'll sometimes stand in honor of the gospel out of love and respect for our Savior and what he has done for us. And finally, we uh, begin this part of the service with the prayer of the day, which is usually an ancient prayer from church history, where we ask God to guide us before we go to his word. And so, we'll continue now with the worship service and with the prayer of the day before we continue with the word. We join our hearts together in prayer. Before the prayer, there is typically the greeting. I will do that now. The Lord be with you. And also with you. And now, let us pray. O Lord our God, so govern the nations on earth and direct the affairs of this world that your church may worship you in peace and joy through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We continue with today's first reading, which is from James chapter 4. It illustrates the basic truth we experience in every worship service. And that's that when we come near to God, He comes near to us. And this doesn't happen lightly. It means we must first humble ourselves by confessing our sins, as we just did in the first part of the service. But that's when we're, we find we're also able to wash ourselves and it's all because of what James tells us here, because God will lift us up. And so we listen as God shares that good news with us here. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> the 
these Psalms, Psalm 150, the scribe for worship looks like from the Old Testament <coughs> hymnal, the Psalter, or as we better know it, the Book of Psalms. As we read these words from Psalm 150, notice how much the Israelites' worship involved music and praise. Well, God does not command us to worship in any particular way. This does explain so much of our worship, especially when we think about the gift that music serves in our lives and how it can memorably embody our thoughts and our beliefs. Uh, today we will read this psalm as you can find printed in your bulletins or on the worship screens. Dear friends in Christ, praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise, Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise, Praise him with the harp and lyre. Praise him with timbrel and dancing. Praise him with the strings and pipe. Praise him with the clash of cymbals. Praise him with resounding symbols. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise, praise the Lord. Now in today's second reading from John chapter 20, Jesus describes the peace that he can bring. Whether you're having a good week or you're having the worst week imaginable, like the disciples were here as he spoke to them. It's why we want to make sure Jesus is the central part of every worship service at the end of every week, or you can say at the beginning of the next week. And it's also why in our worship service, we can announce to each other the best news every week, that we are forgiven and saved and delivered from our sins, just as Jesus instructs his disciples to do here with each other. Out of love for our Savior, in respect for his word, please stand for the reading of today's gospel. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, your sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. And at this time, we'll continue with our next thing, which echoes the value of what we just heard in God's Word as the foundation for our lives. It's the hymn, I'll firm foundation. We'll sing stanzas one and two.
because we're still in this second part of the service, listening to God, we have the sermon. And in many ways, the sermon becomes the featured part of the second part of the service, maybe even the, the service as a whole. It's easy to think of it in that way. But it's really just the same thing we talked about with the readings. It's still all about God speaking to you. It's just that we're focusing on one of these readings a little bit more. We're impacting and applying it to ourselves even more. And granted, there is a human element to a sermon. Uh, do you realize how much work I will put into a sermon every week? I can only speak for myself, but I think it's similar for other pastors. Um, after trying to take Monday off, I'll, I'll usually get to work on a sermon on Tuesday. Uh, and that's a lot of time. It's hours. I will take a look at the sermon either in the Hebrew, if it's an Old Testament text, or in the Greek, if it's a New Testament text. That takes some time. Maybe especially for me, if it's the Hebrew, that takes longer. Then I will look at other Bible passages that relate to what we're talking about and see how they can help me understand that. Then I'll think about what this sermon has to say to, first of all, me and what I need to hear out of it, law and gospel, and then to you and what I get to share with you. And then I'll outline a sermon that all takes place on Tuesday. On Wednesday, I'll spend several more hours writing it and rewriting it and trying to get it into a format that's going to do you some good. Uh, Thursday is usually when I do the bulk of my memorization. Uh, often that involves rewriting the sermon as I speak it out and, and realize some things aren't making sense as I say them out loud, not as much sense as they made on the paper. Uh, and then by the end of the week on Friday and Saturday, I'll often go over the sermon several more times each day just to help it sink in and, and to polish it up. Uh, all in all, I, I probably put about 15 hours a week into a typical sermon. My goal in sharing that with you is not to impress you. I mean that. In fact, if the sermon doesn't come off so well, maybe you'll be now less than impressed since you know how much time I put into it. But I share this with you so that you can be sure that my sermons aren't just off the cuff. It's not just about me or what I think. It's about God and what He thinks. And that's why I feel conscious now to put that much time into it to make sure that I know what God's saying in His Word, and I'm sharing God's Word with you. I suppose it's even why my sermons, any sermon, can come off a little boring at time, at, at times, because our main goal is finally to go back to the text and make sure we know what it says. Only after that can we apply it to ourselves. And finally, that explains my, my prayer before every sermon. Maybe you've noticed me out here praying before sermons. I always pray that, essentially, God would get me out of the way so that you're not seeing me, you're not thinking about what Pastor Nate Walter is saying, but so that, again, through me, you can hear the central message of the Bible. You can hear about Jesus as our Savior from sin. It's the same way the Apostle Paul described his preaching to the Corinthians as a fellow sinful pastor. He told them in his letter to them, I desire to know nothing among you except Christ. And him crucified. And our next hymn will also echo that. Everything in our worship service, the sermon, the music, the responses that we have back and forth, it's all about Jesus and what he does. And so we'll sing our next hymn, In Christ Alone. If you're following along with the hymn, we'll hymn 510, and we'll sing the first three stanzas. <laughs> Thank you. 
after our sermon, we enter into what you may think of as the third part of the service. After approaching God, and after listening to God, we now respond to God. First, we do so by confessing our faith. Uh, usually that involves some kind of creed. Often it's the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed from 1,500 years ago. Sometimes it's something here at Grace will we'll use something from our Lutheran Book of Confession, the Book of Conquer, from 500 years ago. Or even sometimes we may use a section of the Bible that served as a creed for the early church. Some of you may recall around Easter, we always use 1 Corinthians 15, the first seven verses, as our creed. But regardless of the creed we use, it accomplishes a similar purpose as those other old parts of the worship service. We confess the same faith which we realize perfectly saves all people, both now and thousands of years ago, and therefore a faith that we have no reason to change. And so we repeat these creeds again and again. After that, we will give our offerings, which is only natural to do after hearing about God's love for us. Uh, because we need God's grace and favor so much, and we realize that now at this point in the service, yet again, well, we invest in it. It's just like Jesus himself once said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. We live by that. Finally, it's even how you could say that we need offerings. That is, we need to give them for ourselves. Even if God doesn't need our offerings, because we need God. And besides all of that, God does so much good through our offerings and through the church. And then finally, after that, we pray after we are well informed about what God wants in his word in the second part of the service, we are then well equipped to pray according to God's will, just like Jesus did in the Garden of Gethsemane. And the coolest part of all that is God promises that he will always answer that kind of prayer. So you think about that. That means every Sunday you go to church, every Sunday you hear what God wants in his word and you pray accordingly. Well, then you can be sure that God will always answer that prayer. It is powerful stuff. And that's kind of it. And we'll talk about a few more things in our worship service with a couple more explanations, but that gives you the basic structure of our worship service. And honestly, how else would you do it? Notice I'm not asking what else would we prefer in our worship services, but rather what else would help us better worship God. In other forms of worship, people may respond to God without actually stopping to realize who God is and who they are. Or they may not actually stop to consider what God's will is. But when we start with these things, we can be sure that our response will be pleasing to God. And so, let's offer that response today. And we'll do so as we continue with the Apostles' Creed, which you can find printed in your bulletins. We confess our faith together as we confess our faith which saves us. Please stand. We confess, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. And at this time we will continue our response with our offerings, and we'll also have our children's sermon. So I'd like to you know, get to the congregation to come up. Good morning. How are you guys doing today? Good. I 
would like to direct your attention to the screens. I have something I want to show you. Does anybody know what that is? Do you know what that is? That is food on there. Yep, you are right. There's a lot of food in there. And do you notice how it's grouped into different categories? Like, what do you have on the bottom? Are they sorting it? They are sorting it. Yeah, so what's the bottom group is kind of reds and greens and things like that. And then as you move up, what kinds of things do you have? Fruits and vegetables. Yeah, fruits and vegetables. And then how about that next level? What do you have? Fish, meat. Yeah, fish, meat's a type of meat, right? So you got that. Maybe you see some hot dogs, a turkey. And what's on the other side? Cheese. <coughs> Cheese, yeah. Dairy. Dairy. Yep, as you can see, there's a, there's a jug of milk in the background. And then can you tell what's on top? So that's the picture I can find for candy and cookies. Yup, we got everyone chiming in now. I don't blame you. Desserts. Now, if you notice how, what does the pyramid do as it gets closer to the top? It turns into a triangle. Yeah, it turns into a triangle and it squeezes. It gets smaller. Notice how there's more bread and fruits and vegetables. And there's less meats and dairies. And then there's even less cookies and sweets. You know what it's trying to teach us? It's trying to teach us which ones to eat most. The bigger ones. Yeah. And have you have you learned about that already? Maybe in school or your parents talk about that. Yeah, yeah. Like, let, let me ask Addison or Amelia. Do your parents let you eat treats and cookies and candy all the time? No, they don't. You gotta eat your healthy stuff first, and then after you do that, you can have some of the other stuff, right? And do you know do you know why your parents teach you this and why they'll teach you this in school too? You have to be healthy, as that you guys are thinking too. Too much sugar. Yeah, too much sugar at the top. So we want to keep our bodies healthy, right? So that's why the food pyramid's important. It teaches us that. Well, I'm showing you the food pyramid because I think it reminds us a lot of what we do at church. What do you think? What does it take to keep us healthy? Not just our bodies, but what about the inside, our hearts, our souls? Jesus, right? Does he do a good job of keeping us healthy on the inside? And his love, his forgiveness. Yeah, what did Jesus do for you? He died to cross care of our sins. Yeah, he died to take care of your sins, to take away all the bad things. He takes care of you, right? He takes good care of you, gives you whatever you need, right? Jesus, he'll, he'll, does he show us what the right way is? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then, you know, that'll be a good way to go because that's the way God wants, and that's always the best way. So, that's that's what church is here to do. It's to help keep us healthy on the inside, right? And it does it by telling us about Jesus and focusing on him. And that explains why our church services are the way that they are. Let me ask you, would it, would it sound kind of fun if you walked in and there were movies on those screens that you were watching? Does that sound kind of fun? Yeah. Or what if you could run around and play tag in here? Would that be fun? Yeah. yeah. But let me ask you, would that help? Keep your soul healthy. Is that what's going to save you? No, right? We need Jesus. And that's why our church service looks the way it is. You may have noticed, is today kind of a different church service? Yeah, it's been a little bit different. We're talking about all the different parts of church with the adults. And what you guys can learn today is that we have all these different parts and we do church a certain way to help keep us healthy on the inside. And that's why we don't have movies out on the screens or we're not running around. But instead, what do we do in church? Yeah, what do we do? Learn about Jesus. Learn about Jesus, yeah. What are, what's going to help us learn about Jesus? I mean, if, if you know about Jesus, yeah, you know, Jesus will teach you those important things, right? How you can stay healthy here and how you can be kind to your friends. That's excellent. And where does Jesus teach us those things? Elijah. Church, Sunday school, the Bible. In the Bible, yeah. So that's why in church, instead of watching movies or running around, we focus on the Bible. That's why we, we sit and listen quietly so that we can hear what it says. We can learn how to be kind to others. We can learn about Jesus' love and forgiveness, right? And uh, also, if we're quiet, is that going to help other people pay attention to? Yeah. And by the way, you guys do a great job of that. And I'm so proud of you. And I want you to keep working on that because that's how church can really help us, right? And we get to here and we get to learn about Jesus. So we'll keep doing that here at church, all right? Can you tell me about it later, Daniel? All right. Let's let's hold our hands and pray, all right? So 
we bow our heads and we pray, Dear Jesus, thank you for giving us church so that you can feed our souls. You can keep us healthy on the inside. Please help us to keep finding what we need in you rather than just want, trying to get the things that we want because they're not going to help us. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Let's say it together. Amen. All right, thank you so much for coming up. You can go back to your seats. Today we've seen how important worship is for us as adults, and also we see that it's important for our children. We reflected that in our children's room, and we'll do so with our next hymn, which I think one of the kids probably picked, in fact several of them, because I saw it written on the vote tallies and the little child handwriting several times. We'll sing I Am Jesus, Little Lamb, in 804, and we'll sing stanzas one and three.
we remember with thanksgiving those who have loved and served you, who now rest from their labors, console those who are mourning or living with sadness. Keep us in the true faith, and bring us at last to the joys of heaven. Grant us these things, Father, for the sake of Jesus who died and rose again. Amen. We just pray, but don't forget how special that privilege is. Uh, as those adopted into God's family by baptism, God wants us to pray to Him just like a child would go to their parent and ask them for something. And we'll hear that in our next hymn. Uh, with, uh, in 502, we'll sing stanzas one and four, Children of the Heavenly Father.
with them to shepherd his flock until he comes again in glory. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song.
in Christ, which is given for you. And also take and drink, which is the blood of Christ poured out in remission of all your sins. Now, go in peace, your sins are forgiven. Amen. Now may this, the true body and blood of your Lord and Savior Jesus, and may the grace that he pours out on every one of you in his word, strengthen you and keep you firm in the true faith, the life which is everlasting. You can be part of this. Your sins are forgiven. All in Christ. Amen. In the Bible, Jesus also talks about eating this feast of the Lord's Supper with us again in glory. And so we'll Keep that in mind as we sing our next hymn and as we think about those whom we will be reunited with someday in the resurrection of the dead. Those who also feast in our Christ's body and blood and like us are delivered through his redemption for us. Our next hymn is uh, Jerusalem the Golden and it's in 889 of Sing Stanzas 1 through 3.
court. And so now, whatever you face in the coming week, good or bad, blessings or, or challenges, you are well equipped to face them again. And yet, we will all still struggle. It's because we all still have sin. It makes every week a battle. And it's why we need to keep coming back. It's also why we leave with just one more gift. The blessing. And it is a gift. Because the end of the service where you hear the blessing, it's not just the, the period at the end of the sentence, which means we're done, you can go home. Rather, it is God speaking his blessing upon you. It is God empowering you for whatever lies ahead. It is God doing all the things for you and for me that we could never do for ourselves. It's a fitting way to add because finally, that's what the Lutheran service is all about. It's all about what God does from start to finish. Worship is not an act that you or I perform. It is an act that God performs for me and for you. And sure, we have our responses, but even our responses are to what God has already done and what we trust he will continue to do for us. God, who, again, he can do more for us than we could ever do for ourselves. And so we'll pray one more prayer of thanksgiving, and then you will receive the blessing of and then go be salt and light. Show Jesus and his love to others in your words and in your actions. Faithfully fulfill whatever call God has given to you. We'll continue with the final portion of our service. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this saving gift. We pray that through it, you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you. In the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and grant you peace. Amen. And we'll close our service with our final hymn that also captures the gift of the blessing, as well as summarizes so many of the other things we just did in worship. Our final hymn is, Go oh, My Children with My Blessing. It's in 9.30, if you like the music, and we'll sing stanzas 1 and 2.
I watch at the end of that service, that may be the longest service we've ever had here at Grace. But I hope and pray it was a blessing to you. Not just because, Lord willing, as long as I don't get too long-winded after this, every service should be shorter. Sometimes you never know how these types of services are going to go and how long they'll take. Uh, since we're doing some extra things. Um, but even more than that, I, I hope it's a blessing to you that you can understand a little bit more why do we worship in the way that we do. And you can understand the, the ebbs and flows of the Lutheran worship service, whether it's one of the hymnal or just maybe a, what's a more typical service for us on any given Sunday. At my prayer is that you can appreciate that all the more as we praise our Lord in Psalm 150. And as we've seen today, we have, we have so much reason to do so. Uh, so again, I, I hope and pray that's a blessing for you. Some quick announcements, and then I'll, I'll let you go. Uh, this coming week, our schedule is fairly normal. We have Wednesday night Bible study at 7. We'll continue looking through the book of Samuel. Next Sunday, 9 a.m., adult Bible study and Sunday school. We'll continue our journey through Acts. We're nearly at the end because we're focusing on Paul's journeys, and we've got one more chapter to go. Then we have worship at 10. Uh, we'll have a new worship focus. Uh, the, the series is entitled The Time Between. And what we often focus on at the end of the church year, before we start the church year over again, Advent and Christmas, is the end of the world. We, we talk about that time while we're still waiting up here for Christ to return, uh, waiting here on earth for Christ to return a second time. So you can see where the time between would focus us on, well, what do we do with ourselves as we wait for Jesus to come again on Judgment Day? Uh, along with that... Next Sunday, we have a, a very special celebration. Uh, not only is it the church celebration of Reformation, but uh, we are celebrating a fellowship Sunday because of the many new members we've had join our church in the last few months. Um, and yet, because of busy Sundays where people aren't always here, uh, especially in the summer, we had multiple new member Sundays, and then a lot of our members were gone. We're having a big celebration next week, encouraging everyone to be there uh, so that we can get to know each other better and get to know the new members of our church family. Um, those of you who are longer time members, at least longer than this past summer, uh, we're especially asking you to, to bring some food for that celebration. Maybe even bring a little extra for this potluck. And we have a sign-up sheet on the bulletin board that has different categories, so we kind of make sure we have a nice balance of main dishes and sides and desserts and so forth. So uh, if you could sign up for one or, or more of those, that would be greatly appreciated as we look forward to having a great celebration next week. And, and most of all, whether or not you're able to bring something, be sure to be there and bring yourself. Uh, any questions with that? Probably not. We've been talking about that for a while. So, but if you do come up with any, let me know. Uh, other than that, just a reminder, keep an eye out for changes to our online giving. We'll be, we'll be switching that over from Facebook uh, soon to something else. I don't know... I have a pretty good idea of what it is, but I'll give you the details soon. Um, and and we'll, we'll answer any questions you have then. Uh, any other announcements to share with the congregation? Seeing none, great to worship you today. God bless you this coming week. Go forth with God's blessing. And we'll see you on the way out. <laughs> Thank you.